So now you'll see we've got our angle changing very, very slightly as it goes through. But the problem is it's overwritten our original value, so we haven't kept the same effect that we, uh, we were after before. Now again, there's a few different ways we can, we can change this up. Um, of course, if you're used to working with motion, you're used to working with behaviors. The good thing about behaviors is they're, they're a nice simple way of, um, of reducing the reliance on keyframes. So I'm going to come to the parameter and come to the custom here. And I'm going to come to add filters, prism, and angle. And now if I use this slider here, what this is doing is offsetting the, um, the angle data that I had before. So we've got the rotation of the, let's have a look in here. So we've got the rotation we've already used, but what it's doing is using this behavior is it's now offsetting this by this number. So it's adding this number to our, to our rotation keyframes. So using this custom parameter here, we can easily offset uh, any of the, the tracking data that we, uh, that we actually want to use. Um, just as a quick aside, this isn't going to look particularly fantastic, but let's uh, just show you this. Uh, take my little uh, layer here, call it tracked. I'll show you, show you just how we can use behaviors to, to take that tracking data information as well. Let's come into my behaviors, come to my parameters, go to track. And over here, I can select my, my source layer, so where I'm going to get my information from. And that will, of course, be my eye track. So just drag that in there and attach that to the source. Apply that tracking data to uh, my position of this property. And you'll see it now tracks along quite handily with that. But of course, if I didn't want it there, I wanted it over here somewhere. I can just quickly add another behavior uh, under parameter, add my custom, go to properties, transform all here. And let's just uh, transform this over the side somewhere. Bring it down there. Oops. So now you can see it's taken on the same movement. Let's just play that back. It's taken on the same movement but we've just offset it by a certain amount, just using a couple of uh, couple of quick behaviors there. Cool, but that's not what we want to do with this particular shot, so I'm just gonna get rid of that. So really the final thing that I want to do on this is if you have a look, we've got some fantastic uh, film grain going on in the original image, but because we blurred everything else up, let's see, Bring that back to 100%. Ooh, it's a bit harsh. Let's take that not quite to 100% then. To 85. Oh, that's garish. I love it. Oh, look at that. Um, yeah, because we blurred everything up, we, we're losing some of this, um, some of this sort of film grain. So here's a very, very quick technique to, to bring it back again. Uh, let's come into our library, come into our generators, and let's just generate up a color solid. Bring that over the top. Come in here. Going to set that to 50% gray. And that's going to be important. Uh, come to our filters. Stylize. Add noise. And let's take this to uh, a Gaussian noise. And set the entire color solid layer. Take that blend mode to overlay. Now what this has done is it's taken out anything that's, that's sort of 50% gray. It's applied a um, uh, basically a multiply blend mode to anything that's that's uh, darker than fifty percent gray, and a screen to anything that's more than fifty percent gray. So it gives us actually a really nice, uh, nice sort of grain effect there. Now the problem is, of course, again, we're adding grain over everything. So we're adding grain over image that's already got grain on it. So how do we sort that out? Well, we use our old friend, the image mask, and the rad same radial gradient as we've done before. Come back in here, set that to luminance, invert our mask there. Cool, and now we can come into our, our noise 
and just take that down to where we need it. We actually only need a very small amount of noise just to make it give it a bit of life. Just for the sake of argument here, I'm just going to put it to point, point 0.11. So we take a look at our uh, just our original. Let's put this in a in a layer all of its own. So let's just dump everything else into a group here. Turn that group off. So there's our original. And there's our garish eighties prism thing. In fact, I can probably take the prism down a little bit. Thirty two is a bit harsh. That's fifteen. Cool, for the moment I'm, I'm happy with that. We could of course come in and change it. I'm just going to save that there. So Apple S, come straight back into Final Cut. I don't have to do anything else. I mean this updates uh, automatically. Now, of course it's red which means it will have to be rendered. So let's just uh, quickly render that out. There we go and then let's just uh, just play that back. So I think it's really important to see just how you can use that uh, Mocha for Final Cut tracking data in Apple Motion instead of trying to have to do uh, to everything in Final Cut instead. So either by copying and pasting keyframes or using the, the behaviors, we can, we can really get the most out of that, that uh, great tracking data. And because all of the, the Final Cut Studio applications talk so closely to each other, we want to make any sort of changes within our clip in Final Cut. All we have to do is just right click, send that back into motion or open it up in the editor and uh, we can make any, any changes we want to. Cool. So that's it for this little tutorial. I hope it's been useful for you and I'll see you next time.